Okay, hello, good afternoon. So, um, everyone has two sheets. Um, and uh, you, you, you see that that's as discussed. Okay, uh, any questions about that? Okay, okay. Um, so, even the weariest river wends somewhere safe to see. And I guess this is our last meeting. Um, Oh well, um, struggle on somehow. Uh, okay, so um, uh, uh, what I want to do today is not, to, to be honest, I'm not, it's not really so much review as um, point where I think directions forward are, and something about the role of um, consciousness in an account of reference. But uh, let, let, let's just look back on the long road that has taken us to this point. So we began with, um, oh, and at any, uh, since today is kind of review, uh, um, then do feel free to raise questions relating to anything in the course. If, um, and if you think they're reasonably central, <laughs> you see what I mean, uh, th th then do raise anything you like. Um, um, okay, so we began with, uh, Craig on sense and reference and formative identities. Um, Russell on uh, uh, definite descriptions not really referring and uh, really logically proper names not being analyzed descriptively. Leading us into Kripke and the causal theory of reference who tells us that um, how it could go for simple proper names that aren't having their references fixed by descriptions. They could be having their references fixed by causal chains. Putnam generalizes it to natural kinds. Um, Evans uh, polishes up the causal theory. And then we move into whether you could really explain how there can be meaning in um, the world as described by physics using a causal theory of reference. Um, looking at Putnam on brains in a vat along the way. Uh, we then went into Gretschke and Fodor, pressing the causal theory right to the limit and saying, there is no more to meaning generally than the right kind of causal chain. Um, and that kind of uh, peters out a little bit, it seems to me, that discussion. Because on the one hand, if you think, well, my task here is to explain how in the world it's described by science in which there isn't any right or wrong. We can somehow get from that to meaning and the existences of sentences that can go right or wrong. It's very puzzling to see how that can, in principle, be done. I mean, how can you derive an ought from an is? How can you take a description of the way things actually operate in the world and somehow get standards of right and wrong out of that? It is very hard. Once you see what Gretschke and Ford are really trying to do, it's very hard to see how the thing is meant to work. Then Wittgenstein's discussion of following a rule gives you a different approach to um, these questions, looking at his notion of custom or practice. And Wittgenstein does two things. He, um, he throws out the way that uh, we think of reference. He says, maybe you don't need an account of reference in an account of how language works. Maybe what you need is this notion of custom or practice. Um, but when you think about the way it goes with um, Tonk, um, it seems like you need notions of truth and falsity in an account of how language works. And then looking again at Russell's notion of acquaintance, um, uh, we see how we could regenerate the notion of reference and explain how there can be uh, signs referring to um, objects without the use of descriptions by appealing to the notion of awareness of the object. That's, where we, uh, th that's my understanding of where we got to. You, do <laughs> you don't look quite as thrilled as I hoped, but um <laughs> that, 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 that kind of rings a few bells. Right? That's how you remember it too. Okay. Okay, so today I want to go back to something we were looking at when we talked about Evans, um, when we talked about the function of language or the point of language. Um, and then 
I think when you think that maybe these accounts of um, uh, reference could be, you, you could explain how reference works by thinking about conscious experience of the world. Um, there's something about the way we think about a relation to the world around us, the world described by physics, that makes it very hard to see how that could be. And really the main thing I want to do today is look at that and how that these issues play into um, an account of acquaintance. Okay, so remember this idea that the function of language, the reason we've got a language in the first place, is the transmission of knowledge. That's why having a language is a good thing. Um, without a language, um, you find out something. Um, well, that's good for you, but no one else can benefit. Um, with a language, knowledge can be transmitted from person to person. That's the whole idea of a university, right? That's the whole idea. I mean, that's what civilization is, is when we transmit knowledge from person to person. That's why language matters. And you could say, well, what an assertion is, what a statement made, um, a fact-stating remark made in language, what that is, is when you're um, transmitting knowledge to someone or go, at any rate going through the motions of transmitting knowledge. So um, even if I'm telling you a lie or uh, being ironic, when I speak there, I'm talking as if I'm transmitting knowledge. That's the only reason it works. So an assertion is something that's good for transmitting knowledge. And reference is when you're connected to an object in such a way that you're in shape to transmit knowledge about that object. So then, just as you might say, um, Perception is defined by its role in giving you knowledge. And you could say, well, perceiving an object is something that has to give you knowledge of the object. So to be perceiving the object, you've got to be causally connected to the object. Causal connections matter for reference, for perception, because they matter for knowledge. Do you remember that? This is quite a long time ago at this point. The idea that knowledge requires a causal connection to the fact you know, and therefore perception, because it has to do with knowledge, requires a causal connection to the fact. So if an assertion is going to be something that can give you knowledge of the object, then an assertion about the object is going to require a causal connection to the object. Because that's what knowledge is. It's when the object impacts on you um, uh, in such a way that you form a correct belief about it and you then transmit that to other people in such a way that they then form correct beliefs about the object. But there have to be these causal connections back to the object for knowledge to be being transmitted through the community by this process. That's why um, causation matters for reference. Is that OK? Th th that we got that pretty cold? If you don't, this is your chance to complain. Um, OK. OK, so if that, if that works for causation, right, that was the explanation of why causation matters for reference. Because causation matters for knowledge. Is that, is that all right? That, you don't be very convinced, but OK. OK. Well, the idea here is referring to the object is a matter of being in a position in, in which you can make assertions about the object that can transmit knowledge of the object. So reference to the object requires a causal connection with it. And the great thing about this, is, this idea is that it even tells you what kind of causal connection is going to be important. If the object just hits you in the head, <laughs> if the object just knocks you out, that's not going to allow you to get knowledge of the object. Um, it is a causal connection, but it's not the right kind of causal connection. Whereas if you've got the thing in good light, you're getting a good look at it, then it's causally connected to you in such a way that it is radiating information about itself to you, giving you knowledge of it. So that's the kind of causal connection you need for reference, one that can give you knowledge. Um, reference is when you're causally connected 
to the object in such a way that you can transmit knowledge about the object. But if all that works for causation, if that can explain why causation is the right notion, that can also explain why consciousness is the right notion in giving an account of reference. Because um, think again about these blind sight cases. You remember where the patient um, has got no conscious awareness of what's going on in one half of their visual field. Now, a patient who has no conscious awareness of what's going on in one half of their visual field can still be causally connected to the things in that half of their visual field. That's to say, um, the thing might be, let's say, oblong, and you ask the patient, what's the shape of that thing in, you, in, the left, in your visual field? And the patient says, I have no idea. And you say, guess. And the patient is reliably right when they guess. They say, um, I guess it's oblong. If you push me to it, I will guess it's oblong. And you say, that's right. Now, initially, um, the patients in these studies were um, extremely surprised that they were getting it right. They, said they were <laughs> just as surprised as the experimenters. I mean, it was amazement all around. Um, but the thing is, once the patients showed that they had this kind of capacity, um, they have spent the good majority of their lives since in laboratories being tested. They have done this thousands of times at this point. So it is no surprise to them at this point when they get it right. Yeah? So um, what we can say about these patients is they're causally connected to the things of which they have no experience in such a way that they are reliably getting it right about the shape, about the orientation, um, about the size of the things in their blind field. But we never, no matter how many trials they've done, no matter how reliable we know they are, people never say um, the patient knows what's in their blind field. They're always said to be just guessing. They're guessing in a way that they reliably get it right. But they never get knowledge of what's in the blind field. So knowledge doesn't just require a causal connection between you and the thing you're perceiving. This patient's got a causal connection that reliably gives them the right information about what's there in the blind field. Um, this patient uh, uh, doesn't have knowledge about what's in the blind field. We would never say they know that the thing in the blind field is oblong. They never say, I knew it was oblong. They say, well, you made me guess yet again, and I was pretty sure I would get it right. But it wasn't knowledge. When you or I just so unproblematically and easily look at the thing and say we know what shape it is, it's not just the causal connection. It's conscious awareness of the thing that is providing you with the knowledge. So the argument was um, reference uh, to the object is requiring a causal connection. The reason reference is a causal, is a causal notion is that, knowledge, is that knowledge requires causation. Um, you, don't have, um, you can't transmit knowledge about the object unless you're causally connected to it. By that same argument, Reference requires awareness of the object. Reference requires consciousness of the object. Because it's only when you're conscious of the object that you're in a position to transmit knowledge of that thing. So following that line of argument, it's got to be experience of the knowledge that's giving you, sorry, experience of the object that's giving you knowledge of reference. The blind-sighted patient doesn't have any knowledge about what's in their blind field. They're just making reliable guesses. Therefore, they're not in a position to refer to it. Yep. Is there a sense in which you could transmit knowledge if I just treat him as a sort of thermometer? But yeah. Yeah. Should I just treat him as such? So in a sense, you could transmit knowledge just like it's some other reliable device. 
that's right. I, I, I think that's true. I, th I think he could, in that sense, he could transmit knowledge. I mean, I can do that. My, I, 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 what I mean is, um, my sense of direction, I, I usually find myself with very strong feelings about where things are and what way to go, right? I'm reliably wrong about that. I mean, I <laughs> it's not as if I just don't know. I mean, I actually always have a very strong sense of where things are, and it's usually wrong. Um, so someone who knows me well could use me as a thermometer in that sense. They could say, I thought it was over there, but Campbell thinks it's over there, so it can't be over there. Um, you, you see what I mean? So when I say that, there's a sense in which they can use me as a thermometer, but it's not like if you just ask someone the time and they look at their watch and they say, and you, uh, and you just take it in. Do you see what I mean? There's a kind of, usually when that happens, um, if you say what time it is and someone says it's 10 past 3, um, then you don't use them as a thermometer. You just internalize what they just said. You just drink it in. You, 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 you see what I mean? You just internalize their, their remark and take it on yourself. Um, you're not using the other person as a thermometer in that case, in the ordinary case, where, where you, they just say something and you drink it in. That's what transmission of knowledge has got to mean here, that kind of drinking it in. You know, you, 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 someone says something and you just accept it and that's that. Um, with a blind sight patient, you're not just uh, accepting what they say and thereby getting knowledge. I mean, let me put it like this. If you didn't know that the blind sight patient was blind sighted, you just wonder what's in their blind, what is, what, what shape the thing that is in fact in their blind field is. I mean, suppose, suppose you're asking them the time, right? And their watch is in the blind field. And um, uh, you say, what time is it? And they say, it's 10 past three. Um, and you have no idea what's going on. You think this is a regular situation. Yeah. In that case, you don't get knowledge. The way you get knowledge there is by having some background knowledge of the whole situation yourself so that you do understand how this patient functions. I mean, for all you know, the patient might be like me. They might be reliably getting things wrong. You see what I mean? Um, and in that case, you certainly couldn't do it just by drinking it in. In a way, it's only an accident there that the patient reliably gets it right. It's, um, that's just the way the measuring, the, 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 the instrument needle works here. Yeah, that they reliably get it right. They could always be 10 minutes ahead or 10 minutes behind. You need to have the background knowledge. The way it works here is they're always on the button. Yeah. Um, but in the usual case, it's not like that. You just stop someone in the street and ask them what time it is. They look at their watch. You know what time it is. Yeah. You don't need any of that background knowledge about using them as a thermometer. So that's important what you say. But I think there is a contrast here, I think. Is, it, is that? Addressing, yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, flushed with success. That's okay, that's one result. Um, and <laughs> the lecture's hardly begun. Um, okay. Uh, so if this is right, then what is making the whole machine of language work? What is getting us off the ground in the first place? is awareness of the objects around us. That's what is hooping you up to the objects. So the awareness here is more primitive than your ability to think about the world around you. You can make a distinction between two kinds of aspect of your psychological life. There's the thoughts you have, and there's your experiences and sensations. And the picture here is your experiences and sensations are more primitive than your ability to think about the world. And it's your experience of the stuff around you that breathes life into your thoughts, that makes it possible for you to have thoughts about the objects and properties around you. But there is something about the way that physics um, enters into our picture of the world here that makes it seem that can't be right. The picture here is that there's the world out there, there's all the objects out there, and then consciousness is a relation between you and the thing out there. Consciousness is you being acquainted with the stuff out there that you're going to talk about. But if physics is right, then what's out there are not the ordinary familiar objects. What's out there is just atoms whirling in the void. 
let me pursue this a bit. Before we thought about physics, bliss it was in that dawn to be alive, before physicists came along. So this is what the world seemed like back um, to a medieval peasant, for instance. Um, the world was there with all its colors and smells and tastes, and they were all out there, whether we were there or not. We just happened to come upon the, the rich world that we, um, that we usually would take ourselves to know. And we shared the world. There were the same colors and smells and tastes for all of us to encounter. So then we, you really could think of conscious experience as a relation between you and what's out there. Those things were out there before we came. When we land in the world, we can now encounter those things in experience. That's your experience is. And that's how come your experience can let you think about the objects. Because just as Russell thought, it's a relation between you and the stuff out there. But now, the experience is not something just in your head. Experience, the whole experience that you have is a relation between you and the environment. The qualitative character of your experience is constituted by the way things are in your environment. But then physics seems to blow that up. There's always something. Um, I mean, th things, things are going so well. But then physics tells you. Um, I mean, what is the picture that physics gives you of the world around you? I and mean, back in the 17th century, they said, look, if we are right, and we think we are right, then all that there is out there are atoms and the void. The mathematically describable um, uh, characteristics of basic atoms. Um, none of that stuff that you usually think is there is really there. It's mostly empty space with lonely clusters of atoms here and there. But it's mostly empty space, actually. And nowadays, um, Things have not got better, they have got worse. The world as described by quantum mechanics is not a bit like the world we ordinarily think we encounter. The world as described by quantum mechanics is alien. It is unimaginably alien. And usually we operate with a kind of double think about this. I mean, even physicists operate with a kind of double think about this, that on the one hand, you know perfectly well that what science is telling you is that out in the world, there are only these strange particles, these strange forces. Other people, the colors, the smells, the tastes, your mum, all these things, they're not really there. There's only the fundamental particles of physics, the fundamental forces. Um, none of that stuff can be identified with the things you care about. So the conscious, the world you experience, ordinary consciousness, can't be a relation between you and an object. You can't think of consciousness like that as a relation between you and what's out there. You have to think that the visual experience is just something being generated in your brain by all those particles out there. The colors and smells and tastes are just stuff that are generated in your brain. Um, it's just something peculiar to you, idiosyncratic to you, that the physics produces. Out there is nothing like the ordinary stuff for you to encounter. So now it seems like experience must be just a matter of having these throbbing sensations. And that couldn't be what tells you what's going on in the world around you. It couldn't be the foundation for your thinking about the world. If you think that the experience is a relation between you and the world, then that could be what's connecting you to those objects so you can think about them. But if the experience is just a kind of epiphenomenon, just something being generated backstage in the brain, then how could that be what puts you in touch with the world to think about it? 
How could that be what makes it possible for you to think about what's really out there? What's really out there is all this alien stuff. And actually, um, it's not just that your experiences couldn't be letting you think about the world. I mean, other people's experiences, for all you know, could be completely different to yours. So long as you thought there's just one world out there with all the colors and smells and tastes and all the regular objects in it, and I'm encountering it, then other people would have the very same experiences if they encountered the same world too. But in this picture, other people might be having experiences that are completely different to yours. All that's really going on is that the fundamental particles are generating these sensations. And these sensations bear no resemblance to what's really going on. Um, and since they don't bear any resemblance to what's really going on, and you, uh, you, other people could be getting it. They're just haphazard collections um, of sensation. And other people could be getting quite different haphazard collections to the ones you get. And in fact, some other people might not be getting anything at all. They might just be getting brain states and no experience. Everything would just be going on as it is in accordance with the fundamental laws of physics. I think something like that is the picture people usually have of um, uh, our, our relation to the world is described by science. As I say, there's a kind of double think in it. Because this is a terrifying picture, really, when you think about it. I mean, out there is just this weird stuff. I mean, think about what is going on right in this room at the moment, in this spatial zone, if physics is correct. Um, it's none of the regular stuff. It's just this weird um, uh, alien configurations of particles. Now, in that world, the world is described by physics, where physics is giving you, I mean, physics, after all, claims to give you comprehensive coverage of everything that's going on. Then, in that world, there simply isn't anything that you could possibly care about. None of the stuff that we actually want to think about or that we do care about is there in the world as described by physics. This is what I mean about doublethink. Because after all, even physicists go shopping, they go to the store, they make dinner, they, be, they, they interact like regular people. They don't actually try to live with this picture. But at the same time, the official story is, this is really what the correct picture of what's going on. And that's what pushes consciousness back into your mind, makes it just an epiphenomenon, couldn't be what is relating you to the world around you. But if physics is, is right, if the usual interpretation of physics is right, in the world that's really here in this space-time zone, there aren't other people, there aren't tables and chairs, there aren't colors and smells. Um, there are just configurations of particles and these sensations that you're having. Nothing to care about. So what is the right reaction to that picture? Abject terror? I mean, <laughs> the, the metaphysical scream um, when you realize what they're really saying. This is what, yeah? There's a causal chain, yeah. Back from atoms and the fundamental particles to me and you. Okay. So you can track that causal chain down as to what physicists are doing, but that doesn't eliminate all the different levels of description. Very good. So you could say it's different levels. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, if you do that, if you take that line, what happens to the regular world? Is that all out there? Or is that an aspect of our consciousness? Sure, okay, so it's got nothing to do with our consciousness. Well, our consciousness is part of that. Yeah, but consciousness is just one thing among many. Yeah. Right? 
So the colors and the smells and the tastes, and they're really out there. Um, uh, and our minds are there too, but it's all just different levels. Yeah. I think that's correct. I think that's the right move. Yeah. So I'm not supposed to agree with these questions, <laughs> but I do. I think that's absolutely the answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, you mentioned, yeah. I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I, 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 yeah, I think that's absolutely the right way to think of it. Um, I would point out that it's kind of um, <laughs> the, the usual picture that scientists, including physicists, have is that no, the colors are just an aspect of your mind. Yeah. Um, what you guys are saying is you don't believe that for an instant. We should start out with the idea that the colors are just out there. And we find out about them by being aware of them. Yeah. Now I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah. But that's. But I just want to. It's not trivial what you're saying. Yeah. The, the, I mean, it's not obviously correct. But I think it is correct nonetheless. Okay. So we throw out that picture of consciousness as just something generated by the physics. I mean, except in so far as everything is generated by. It's not as if. The usual picture is that there are two parts to the world. There's physics and there's consciousness. And everything that isn't just described by basic physics, everything that isn't just um, this stuff, is a projection of consciousness onto the underlying reality. Right? Now, what we're agreeing is we can throw that picture out. As you said, we should not regard physics as the given. The given is the ordinary world, the medium-sized world that we encounter and experience. Um, and uh, your point was, well, we can describe that world at many different levels. But to say something can be described at a high level is not to say a high level of description is just a projection of consciousness. Yep. Very good. Um, OK. So if that picture was right, there would be nothing to refer to out there in the world. There would be us and our sensations. There would be the physical reality. But um, what we're agreeing is we can throw that out, that picture. We can stay. We didn't have to leave the dawn in which it was bliss to be alive. We can stick with that picture of the medium-sized world. <laughs> Mom can come back. <laughs> yeah, don't spoil it. <laughs> yeah. 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 It is a chair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, there are two ways of hearing this. Um, uh, 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 on, on one way of hearing it, that notion of clump is, um, I mean, it's not a technical term exactly, but it is, well, I guess it is. A it's a semi-technical term. Where, um, what it is, it's, it's, it's a high-level way of describing a collection of atoms. Right? Um, and it's just roughly equivalent to chair. Right? Um, the, the key move, though, is um, suppose you ask, what organizes that collection of atoms into a clump. Right, if you, if you take that view, the organization is out there in the world, independent of us, yeah? Then this is the view that we are developing, yeah? 
The other view, the, the, the view that I'm saying most physicists, I think, would actually buy, uh, I mean, and m yeah, many people would buy, is that no, um, what organizes a clump of atoms into a chair is that we project chairness onto it. That after all, whether something is a chair, look, let me just try and, <laughs> I find myself having to argue the other side, um, but um, what makes a, what, what makes something a chair has to do with our interests, our objectives. Um, if there had been no humans, there would be no <coughs> point to saying these things are chairs or these things are yellow. These things are anthropocentric distinctions. That's, that, that's the idea on the other side. But this is a skull, and around that yeah. is a gap. So then just like that gets a chair. So then you Very good. When I say a chair, I mean the thing that says this skull. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So then they They'd have to, yep. Well, to all right. Le, 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 I, I, I don't want to push this too far because I really have no interest in winning this argument. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I, I guess the, the view on the other side would be, after all, being a ch to be a chair is, is not enough that it be solid, right? Suppose that just for the purposes of demonstration, I take a hatchet to the chair, right? Um, and so I leave, <laughs> just before class comes in, I take a hatchet to your chair, and uh, I leave you with just a splintered collection of matchwood, yeah? And you say, where's my chair? What have you done to my chair? I say, the chair's fine. The chair's still there. Look, it's solid. <laughs> right? it, it, it's not enough that, that it just be solid, yeah? It's got to be organized a particular way. Very specific, actually. You know, I, I could do it in lots of, I could destroy your chair in lots of subtler ways than that. Um, um, and if you ask, well, what, what exact kind of organization makes it a chair? The only way you'd, the, the argument is the only way you'd have to explain that is we treat it like a chair. It strikes us as a chair. It's really a mentalistic thing, is that we project that onto this collection of atoms. Yeah. Something like that is the argument on the other side. Um, yeah. But the color, oh yeah. That's, like the view. that's right, that's but right. That doesn't segregate consciousness outside of physics. It just allows other physics. Yeah, it's not that consciousness is outside physics, the, 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 uh, exactly. It's that um, um, all these other high level classifications of the world depend on consciousness. The, the, that's really the key idea. Um, so the way you just put it is very natural, I think, that. Um, uh, what colors are in the world depends on the relations to our mind. Okay. But that's what we're rejecting. Aha. Oh, that's right. But the question is does that show that blueness is out there independent of us? Not the wavelength, the blueness. Right, it's a projection of the human mind onto, onto the wavelengths. The wavelengths are the reality. The human mind carves them up in this way. Some alien species might carve it all up a different way. Yeah? What colors are in the world depends on how it's being perceived. Is it? What's going on here is not to threaten the idea of conscious experience. No one's challenging. Conscious experience is fine, right? It's how you think of what conscious experience is. One picture is, here is the color out in the world. Nothing to do with minds. It's just there. Um, and over here is the mind. And the mind is related to that color. And that's what it is to have a color sensation. The color comes first. Um, the other picture is, um, out there in the world, there are no colors. There are only the wavelengths. And what happens is that these wavelengths produce sensations. That's all the color there is, that production of sensations by the wavelengths. So if you have that second picture, the sensation is not a matter of you being related to something out there. 
The sensation is just something being generated in you, and it might be quite different in you than in me. Yeah. So, is it, yeah, uh, to tell you the truth, it's not so much I want to force one picture on you rather than the other, but um, uh, I just wanted to be clear there's a difference here between these two pictures. Are you at any rate, is it plain what the issue is, what the question is? Yep. I'm putting them both on the table and I'm saying um, this view, this view is very hard to believe. Um, it takes a, it alienates us from the world we experience and I myself for that reason, I think we should go for um, we should go back to before we knew about physics, um, and keep that picture of the world in place. And I guess my point is, um, it would be it would be obviously appealing to be able to do this. It would restore our sense of the shared world. Um, it would explain how experience can make it possible for us to think about the world, um, and. These arguments about different levels actually show you how you could keep this in place, this medieval picture. You, you, you see what I mean, that picture from before the scientific revolution? Um, uh, that, that could stay intact, even if you think physics is just fine. It's just that interpretation of physics. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you say, oh, that's handy, um, that doesn't have to be a part of the world that was there independent of you, the handiness of it. Uh, 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 yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, my inclination, uh, my, uh, just, from the point of, just from the point of view of making it clear what the opposition is here. My inclination is to keep that kind of thing to a minimum, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Um, but, uh, but yes, I mean, it would be unreasonable to say that there aren't some things. Um, being icky, you, you see what I mean? The, the, there are going to be plenty of things where you'd have to be very hard-headed to say, yes, the ickiness was out there, and you just found out about it. Uh, yeah. Um, I think actually with the colors, just commonsensically, it is a considerable bit of alienation when you think nothing is really colored, nothing in itself is colored. All that's happening in color vision is that these sensations are being generated in me. That's where you get the problem. That's how it comes about that there's a problem of um, how do I know that your um, color sensations are the same as mine? Yeah, I mean, people often put that as a great insight. You know, there's a real that I saw that there was a real problem here, um, is just generated by this way of thinking about color experience. Yeah? If you hold on to this picture of color experience, yeah, then um, there isn't such a problem. Because this flower out there is the same that you and I are both encountering. So if its color is the same thing that you and I are both acquainted with, then we are having qualitatively the same experience. That's what it is to have qualitatively the same experience. And I think, you know, that's how we usually, yeah, what, let, me, let me just check the time. That's how we, that is how we usually think about color. Oh, okay, um, <laughs> thank you. If you think about Picasso um, 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 working on a canvas, right? Um, Picasso is not saying, here I am manipulating a whole bunch of atoms um, in the hope that it will generate color sensations in other people, which will be quite different to my color sensations. You know, God knows what they're all getting when they look at this. Um, uh, but I hope that they will find them agreeable, because I certainly get some quite agreeable ones when I look at the canvas. That's not what he's thinking. He's thinking, no, out there is, um, out, sorry, out there is the canvas with the colors on it, and I am working on that. These you, you know, we, that's how we usually think about colors. 
as out there and that you and I are taking in the same ones. He's taking it that everybody's taking in the same collection of colors when they look at the canvas. That's how we usually think about it. And that's what I mean. It would be a, a big, a, a lot of alienation in um, uh, detaching yourself really from that picture. That's what I mean about double think. People don't really rigorously do this in everyday life. Um, yeah. Yeah, project stuff onto it. Yeah. Well, if, if, if what's going, suppose that what's going on is this, that there's just the world described by physics, there's just this stuff. You and I are evolved collections of molecules mo navigating through this stuff. Why do we have sensations? The only reason we have sensations is because they have some adaptive value. So the color sensations just have some adaptive value in letting you navigate through all this. Um, but, and this would be too complex, you couldn't really um, compute all, all this stuff if you've got the raw data, if you've got it right. Yeah? So what you get is these convenient fictions. That's all your sensations are. Um, and uh, it, it, for them to work, it doesn't really matter what they're intrinsically like. Yours could be quite different to mine, really. And still, we could be navigating through these seas of um, uh, particles um, quite successfully, even though your, yours are intrinsically quite different to mine. Um, uh, so in that sense, we're alienated because I really have no idea what your color sensations are like. And more than that, my color sensations have got just nothing to do with the reality out there. I was saying, following Russell, we can think of experience as what makes us capable of thinking about the world around us in the first place. But in this picture, your sensations don't make you capable of thinking about anything. All they do is they let you navigate successfully. Yeah? But the reality, you're completely cut off from the reality. You have no idea until you did a physics course. You didn't have a clue that any of this was going on. Yeah? Your sensations didn't tell you anything about the way the world really was. They just adaptively let you navigate successfully. I, thought, I suppose I have two minutes now to wrap everything up. So, OK. <laughs> so. The, <laughs> But, that's, but this is good. I mean, the, 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 these are important questions you're raising. Yeah, uh, I mean to state the opposite case, but I, yeah. OK, so I was saying last time we can think of our encounter with the world out there as being conscious of the thing from a point of view, being conscious of the medium-sized object from a point of view. And you can take it that the qualitative character of your experience, you might get the same thing from different points of view. But if two people occupy the same points of view, looking at the same scene, that's going to be the same experience. Um, I mean, really, if you remember Putnam on brains in a vat, Putnam was saying um, the brain in a vat has to be getting it right about its environment. And um, uh, therefore, if the brain in the vat's getting it right about its environment, you and I are certainly getting it right about our environment. But the thing is, if you think about the brain in the vat, there's some sense in which the brain in the vat has no idea of what is going on in the vat, right? It, 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 the world is not a bit like the way it thinks it is. Yeah, It's having these sensations, but its sensations bear no resemblance to the vat world. Um, if the usual picture is right, if this picture, if the, if the physics picture is correct, then we are actually in exactly the same position as the brain in the vat. We are having these sensations um, that bear no resemblance to what's going on in the world around us. Our sentences might be interpreted so they come out right, but um, they're not, we don't really have a clue what is going on. Um, we're getting a picture where we are no better off than the brain in the vat. Um, and this is what is hard to believe, that our mental life is just phosphorescence, 
there's some external phenomenon reliably causing this luminous um, sensation uh, out there. In that sense, it's a sign of the phenomena out there. But um, it doesn't give us any knowledge of what our environment is like. The common sense picture, the pre-scientific picture, is that ordinary experience is telling you what your surroundings are like, what the people around you are like. Um, there's a kind of knowledge you have there of what the world is like that goes beyond anything that the brain in the vat has. That's what this picture, in terms of acquaintance, has to uh, appeal to. The idea is that the standards of right and wrong aren't just being set by causal connections. They're being set by the knowledge we have from experience of what the world is like. The brain, if the standards of right and wrong were just set by causal connections, we can say the brain in the vat is winning all down the line. There's nothing that's getting wrong. Is this extra thing, the knowledge we have from experience of what the world is like, that the brain misses, that we think we have? You could put it like this. If physics is right, then the world isn't at all the way we ordinarily think it is. All your sensations are doing is providing you with some indicators, some signs of the bizarre physical phenomena that are what's really going on. And we're just like the brain in the vat in that we don't ordinarily have any understanding that goes beyond that. But if, as was just said, um, we should keep the ordinary picture in the world and say, of the world and say, well, physics is just describing it at a finer level of grain then we can keep that Rossellian picture of acquaintance and say, ordinarily, we are acquainted with the medium-sized world. Ordinarily, that's what we're experience, experiencing. And that's how thought um, and language get off the ground in the first place. OK, I've kept you late for one last time this term. Um, but thank you very much. Actually, I just want to say, you, you guys have been so thoughtful and engaged all the way through. It's just been a pleasure to take this class. Thank you. Thank you.